ki te tonga ki a mā kene kene ki uta, ki a mā tāna tāna ki tāi, e hi ake a te ana atakura he te o he huka, he hauhu ti hei mauri ora. Ko rihi te pō, ko rihi au, he tūria ki te matatau nō tū, tū te winiwini, tū te wanawana, tū hukitia, tū hapainga, tū whakaputa ki te whai au, ki te au mārama, haumie, huie, tai hea. Ngā mihi ki te atua mātu i te rangi, nō ngā rawa te kaihanga o ngā mea katoa, kia whakapai tōne ingo a ke tōnu ake. Te whare e tūnei, tēnā koe, e te marae, e takto nei, tēnā koe, tēnā kōrua. E ngā mate, haere, 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 te hunga mate ki te hunga mate, te hunga ora ki te hunga ora, tātou te hunga ora. O rangi tū mau te maunga, ko rua mahanga te awa, ko kaimunu ki Wairarapa, me ko rangi tāni o Wairarapa, ngā iwi, ko hulunu e o rangi te marae, me ko hunui, e ori ore, tāpā wai, ngā marae, ko Nolin, Naira, me rānira me te kumatua, Ko Kepa Smataku Ingo, Kai Tūti for Carleton District Council. Yeah, nau mai, hada mai, pakatau mai rā. Hada mai ki kaunihira a rohe, rāda tharatahi, nau mai, haere mai. Tēnei rā, te mihi pakatau rangitāni o Wairarapa, me Ngāti Kaumūni o Wairarapa. Um, district Plan Review, Joint Committee Hearing Panel, did I get that right? Uh, yeah, whakatau mai rā ki runga i a mātou, uh, ki konei, uh, ka ranga mai te kaupapa o te rā, uh, ka pai te noho tahi ki a mātou, uh, ko te tūmanako ki a pai te noho ki konei, uh, ngā manaakitanga o te kaunihira o taratahi, uh, a kamutu te kōrero uh, uh, o taratahi, uh, o te iwi wā. Um, the mote te that I'm going to do today is, uh, it's about this area, Hurunui uh, Orangi, and it was written by Auntie Hene Paiwai. I'm still kind of just learning it myself, but I thought it was appropriate to do here um, for, for this. It had everything to do with this meeting, put that way. All right, so we'll go. Otahawa, te awa wai pōpō. Rere atu ki roto, i a tau e rue, i nana. Wera whai tiri pau pau rangi te awa tiko rangi rere atu ki roto, i a mātaha kai, kai whera. Ngā kōrari o te awa manga whitau, e rere ana ki roto mā kaha kaha. Aue, aue te aroha e, te awa tau e ru te awa mā kaha kaha rere atu ki roto. I a rua mā hanga hai rera ki. Wairarapa mō ana e, tū mai, i runga i a manu ka tū mai, i runga i a whare kau i titi te rō whakararo, ko te au wahi o ngā hika e pūpū ana. Ko nei ngā taka wainga, ko nei ngā papakai, ngā ao mātou, tipuna e. Au e hurunui, tane whaka, piripiri, huarau, hene waka rangi, tātai atu pūru pūru, waira kau tane rō, tāhu pōtiki ko. Maunga rake tenei e. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tāta katoa. Nā mi. Thank you. Kia ora, Kepa. That was a very polished performance. Thank you very much. Nā mi. Thank you for your fellow attendees. I'll officially open what is 
day one of hearing stream one uh, to the combined district uh, Wairapa district plan hearings. Uh, this marks the culmination of over four years work and I'd just like to acknowledge uh, those in the room that have been involved uh, from the inception and particularly uh, Hamish Wesney and his team. Um, my name is David McMahon. I'm the chair of the uh, Combined District Plan Hearing Panel. It's a, it's a real honour and privilege for me to be involved um, with this process. Um, this is the second review of the Combined District Plan, or well, the first review, but the second Combined District Plan. Um, the Wairarapa Councils have been uh, lamplighters, if you like, in the production of a Combined District Plan. Um, there's not many, if any, around the country. Um, the West Coast region and the South Island is currently going through a combined district plan and hearings, but uh, certainly uh, in 2010, the combined uh, Wairarapa councils were leading the way in this space. So, as I said, it's a privilege to be involved and to be involved in the second review of that. Um, I'm going to just briefly ask my fellow uh, commissioners to introduce themselves and then we'll take a record of attendances from uh, staff that are present. So if I could start with uh, my Deputy Chair on the right, Robin. Kia ora, I'm Robin Cherry Campbell, um, Commissioner mm. and Councillor at Carterton District Council. Uh, kia ora everybody, I'm Brian Della, uh, Commissioner and uh, Councillor at Carterton District Council. Kia ora koutou koutou, ko kere ana um, toku ingwa. Um, I'm also hearing commissioner for the panel and uh, represented Ngāti Kapanuni. Kia ora. Oh, tēnā koutou i te whānau. Um, ko Jo Hayes tōku e ngō, uh, tēnā koe uh, ki pa mō tō mahi ki a kaita, ki a, ki a, um, ki a mātou. Um, me o uh, ho tautoko. Kia ora. Um, as I said, I'm Jo Hayes. I represent Rangi Tāne o Wairarapa iwi. Kia ora. Kia ora, Alistair Plumer, um, Commissioner and Councillor from South Wairarapa District Council. Kia ora, uh, Brian Jefferson. Uh, I've been appointed by the South Wairarapa District Council to be a Commissioner on this um, review. Kia ora, Fraser Marmon. Um, I've been appointed as Commissioner by the uh, Marston District Council. Kia ora, Craig Bowyer, uh, Commissioner and Representative for Marston District Council. Thank you, team. Um, Hamish, could I invite you to introduce yourself and the team that we're presenting over the next uh, couple of days? Well, uh, Hamish Wesney, consultant planner for Bothmer School, um, engaged by the councils to uh, assist with the district plan review and proposed plan. <coughs> uh, kia ora, everybody. Uh, Solitaire Robertson, planning and regulatory manager at Carterton District Council and one of the report authors for Hearing Stream 1. Katie to go next. Uh, Katie Treadway, uh, planet at Boffin School and uh, one of the authors for Hearing Stream 1. So we're here from Solitaire, Katie and myself today, um, but we'll introduce everyone else while we're, while we're here. So. Kia ora, Russell O'Leary, Group Manager Planning and Regulatory, South Wairarapa Council. Tēnā tātou koutou, Iuri Anō, Wairarapa, Wai Ngātikaununu, Rangitāni, uh, tēnā koe matua mō tō mihi whakatau i tēnei ata. I whakadunu i te mahi o, o mātou i tēnei wā. Uh, tēnā koutou uh, nā koari i tēnei whaupapa matua. Ai, so um, I'm Leanne Karona, I'm the Pauahuri of Māori at Marston District Council. Once sell the way to run for District Council. Tēnā. That's why I thought. Kaupau katoa, Coach Marie Tokoingoa. Ko ngā tuiri tukui whānau, uh, I'm Shri Ngātwiri, also Jibri. I'd like to use my, like to use my um, Tupuna's name. Um, I work for Carleton District Council alongside with Kipa. Um, so Ngā Mihi, um, Matua, thank you so much for um, your presence here today and our Tupuna was felt. Um, and I also work very closely with Liam um, as well at Marston District Council. We almost do our own little bit. Thank you. <laughs> Kia ora, Becca Adams. I'm a planning officer at Carterton District Council. Yeah. Thanks, Sue Salvi, planning officer at Carterton District Council. 
got a um, Alice Malone um, planner at Marston District Council. Um, Kiara Christine Chan from Marston District Council of Manningham. Uh, good morning. My name is Erica Wheatley. I'm a planner with Lachlan. Good morning, Atato. I'm Karen Yates. I'm the General Manager of Strategy and Development at Marston Council. And I'm Harriet Kennedy. I'm the Governance Team Leader at Marston District Council. Yes. Last but certainly not least, Ruth, uh, you're, the, you're the glue that's going to keep us all together over the next uh, period right through to the last hearing stream that's um, scheduled for May 2025. Should add that these proceedings are being recorded, they're not being live streamed, but I understand that the recordings will be put up, if possible, on a daily basis uh, onto the web page. And could I also add that the web page should be your friend. Um, I'm saying for those that were listening online eventually, um, go there for any material. Um, it, it will contain all of the officer's reports, all of the expert evidence, and any representations that we receive in writing during the course of these proceedings will go on there also. Um, so that, that is uh, something for you to embrace the web page. So thank you, Ruth. Excuse me, David, I'm just going to go out now. Yeah, thank you. Now me, everyone. Now me. Yeah. <laughs> um, these proceedings um, will have a degree of formality, and that's just out of necessity. The, the, the structure of the proceedings forces some degree of formality. We hear from the officers first, uh, then we hear from submitters, usually those who are presenting expert evidence first, and then what we call lay submitters. And then uh, we have questions of those parties, and then we have a final right of reply from the officers for each hearing stream. And that'll normally be 10 to 15 working days after the, after the hearing uh, is adjourned for each hearing stream. Um, I took the opportunity of uh, circulating in minute two some hearing procedures that will govern, uh, govern these uh, developments. It's a fairly weighty time. Um, I'm sure everyone's read it. Um, it's some um, uh, 105 paragraphs, but it was really to just to make sure that those that are attending and are new to these proceedings aren't taken by surprise as to uh, what will uh, what will happen during the course of the proceedings, what to expect, how to prepare, how to present, and uh, an indication of how long the process will take. So. They are very much uh, a live document and they're on the web page also. Purpose of today's uh, thing is to hear from the authors of the five 22A reports that uh, comprise hearing between one, and they are strategic direction, Hangata Whenua, the whole of the plan, part one and what's called interpretation, which is largely uh, definitions uh, associated with, with the plan. And we'll probably take it in that order. Um, the plan is that we will um, invite each officer to speak to a summary statement that they've presented in relation to their report. Um, we'll then take questions on uh, that matter of clarification. And those questions might be related to both the summary statement and the original 42A report. And then we'll move on to the next topic. Um, I don't think we'll take all of today, um, but we have all of today allocated should we need it. And we'll start Thursday uh, hearing from submitters. Thursday is going to be a fairly full day. Um, we have some 15 submitters to hear from. The panel uh, maintains a running register of interests. That's primarily uh, to record any matters that the panel members have been involved in that may impinge on these proceedings in some way. And that's not to say that they are conflicts of interest, but merely a record of matters so that there's full transparency as to the various business dealings and personal dealings that the panel has maybe with submitters, maybe with officers, uh, maybe with the district plan itself. Um, my role is to 
regularly review that register and determine whether any of those registers of interest uh, could potentially become matters of conflict. And I, I will do that on a basically a daily basis. Um, and you'll see the register is kept online on the web page, and you'll see that where, um, where certain interests are potentially matters of conflict, we've uh, devised a strategy so that the particular panel member uh, is not involved in either hearing the submission or in the deliberations of those submissions. That's pretty much standard operating procedure for panels like this. Um, but it does involve a degree of discretion, and it is something that's visited on a daily basis. Um, checking my notes. That's all I have. Are there any matters of procedure that are arising that anyone would like to afford my attention at this stage? No, that's always good to have a negative on that. Um, in that case, um, I don't think we should delay proceedings any further. I invite uh, Mr. Wesley to come up to the table and um, speak to the first topic, which is correction. Thanks, Mr. Wesney. Um, you want to read the statement of full or take us through it? And no, that? I think read it in full. Um, just to, because uh, it's, it's just over, over five pages. I probably won't read out the, the last list because it's in terms of matters of contention, because that's um, the summary of what's covered. But I think just to give you the benefit to understand the position. Um, sure. So, Morning, um, morning, Commissioners. Take just the first two paragraphs as read in terms of who I am. I've done the introduction. And so, paragraph three purpose and content of the strategic direction chapter reflects the approach in the national planning standards uh, to provide a single chapter that contains the key strategic matters for the districts and guide decision making at a strategic level. Uh, the strategic direction chapter contains objectives, uh, no policies or rules, as the purpose of this chapter is to provide this overall strategic direction. The objectives are to be read together, and there's no hierarchy between them. The objectives are grouped into seven topics based on the key uh, significant issues identified in the district plan review. Uh, a total of 178 original and 233 further submission points were received on this chapter. Um, there was support across all seven topics, um, with numerous submissions requesting amendments to the wording of specific objectives. Uh, it's limited outright opposition or request to delete specific objectives. Uh, in response to submissions received, I've, I've recommended most of the objectives be retained as notified or amended. The recommended amendments are primarily to improve the clarity and usefulness of the objectives and do not materially change the outcomes sought to be achieved objectives. In paragraph six, I've listed the evidence that's been received, so I won't um, those details. In just paragraph eight, uh, a noted hearing statement has been received from Transpower New Zealand, which contains a response to the strategic direction chapter with a potential of perceived conflict of interest and covers Transpower's comments on the strategic direction and her introductory statement on part one. Yes, well, we hear from Ms. Robertson as part of your presentation then? Uh, we can, we haven't talked about that. If, if, if that would be helpful, we can put, um, add that in at the end. But just just so that, um, to the extent that it's this issue, what we'll probably do and when we come to questions, it will probably look at the second grouping 
and um, where um, Transpower's interests are represented, maybe Ms. Robertson can, um, can chime in. Yeah, uh, the the matter from Transpower is not related to one of the objectives. Okay. More of the relationship between the objectives and the strategic direction and the other chapters. No other, no other um, oh, well, that, has raised, so it's a, it's a, it's a discreet. It's a discreet matter. In that case, um, remain seated and we'll deal with you in, in turn. <laughs> Thank you for that. You, you notice I do have a habit of interrupting, so I'll put that apology in there. Yeah. Happy to take questions as we go. <laughs> so key issue one, is our climate change and resilience objectives. Uh, so objective two, Ms. Solner considers objective two should be amended to recognise the role of natural ecosystems and processes to build resilience into the natural and built environments uh, to adapt to the effects of climate change. I do not support the suggested amendments to this objective as it changes the focus and application of this objective as well as introduces how to achieve the objective but it's not appropriate um, for an objective. Uh, objective three, Ms. Leveson uh, considers objective three should be amended to provide a strategic, uh, strategic goal uh, to provide for activities that support the resilience and well-being of Wairapa residents and the continued functioning of the local economy during and after adverse events. Uh, sorry, that should be um, rather than adverse effects, that should be adverse effects uh, or adverse events, natural hazards, natural hazard events, yes. While I agree with Ms. Leveson about the strategic goal, as set out in the Section 42 report, I do not consider this goal as appropriate in the context of a district plan as it relates to local government functions outside the RMA. Objective 5, Ms Foster considers a new objective um, on renewable electricity should be added to the climate change and resilience section of the strategic directions chapter to recognise the significance um, and the strategic issues facing New Zealand on renewable energy. Um, Mr Matthews also considers a new objective on renewable electricity should be added to the climate change and resilience section uh, for similar reasons to Ms Foster. Uh, as stated in the section 42A report, I consider the outcomes for renewable electricity are already appropriately recognised and provided for in the energy chapter. Um, I understand the strategic basis for adding an objective to the strategic directions chapter. However, I consider it's likely to duplicate the objectives um, in terms of the outcomes that already exist in the energy chapter. Um, Accordingly, at this time, I still do not support adding an objective to the strategic chapter. Um, just a housekeeping matter, uh, Mr. Wesney. Um, when you reference the uh, the witnesses, um, could you just for the record indicate who they're representing? So, for Ms. Solner, I've got Greater Wellington Regional Council. Correct. Uh, Ms. Leveson, Port, Port New Zealand. New Zealand, yes. Ms. Foster, Meridian Energy. Correct. And Mr. Matthews, Genesis. Yes. Thank you. I'll, I'll add that as I go through. Thank you. Uh, so moving to key issue two, uh, natural environment. Uh, objective five, I note the support from Ms. Zona for, re for the Regional Council for the recommended amendment to uh, objective five, as she considers that it better reflects or better recognises the national policy statement for fresh water management. Uh, Ms. Zona, so considers adding a new objective to reflect to Mana OTY in the hierarchy of obligations in the national policy statement for freshwater management is appropriate as it would reflect the MPS's impetus to recognise the connection between urban development and the effects on freshwater. And I note Ms Foster from Meridian Energy addresses this request from Regional Council for a new objective. I agree with the points made by Ms Foster that giving effect to the NPS is not confined to regional council jurisdiction and regional plans. However, I consider that applying to Mana OTY and the hierarchy of obligations in a general way to all development, use and subdivision of land that affects freshwater, uh, complex with the broader considerations in Section 5 um, sustainable management purpose of the RMA as it applies to land use and subdivisions. So, paragraph paragraph 19, uh, Mr. Gensor for Fulton, uh, 
um, is concerned the recommended amendment to objective uh, one is a general reference to land use and does not differentiate between activities that are promoted or undesirable in the room and states that this objective should be clarified council has proposed replacing um, the phrase and land use activities in the environment with primary production and ancillary activities i agree with mr ensor his wait have a hearing aid <laughs> you can read it, I'm silent. Right, yeah. <laughs> it's the emergency services provisions and yeah. an action. <clears throat> Subject of a and, and, fair extreme. And the exception is. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, partway through paragraph 19, um, I scored <laughs> like. Here we go. Yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll just pause. <laughs> <laughs> Some of the fire service are moving towards pager notifications. Now. They do have them as yeah. well here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, fifth line down in paragraph uh, 19, I agree with Mr. Ensor. His wording provides greater clarity on the types of land use activities in the rural environment that contribute positively to the economic and social well-being of the Wairapa. However, I consider the current broad wording recognises the wide range of activities in the rural environment that contribute to the social and economic well-being, including non-primary production-related activities, such as community activities. Um, I continue to support the wording recommended in the 42A report. Foster and her evidence for Eastleigh now, so differentiating her evidence from Meridian Energy, contends there's an overlap between objectives two and three, with both focusing on retaining rural land for primary production. In addition, she states that there's also potential overlap and confusion in their focus on protecting uh, productive capacity generally in objective two, and the productive capacity of highly productive land specifically in objective three. I agree with the points made by Ms Foster. Uh, the objectives uh, two and three can be better expressed to clarify the outcome sort. Um, I adopt the wording proposed by Ms Foster with one exception, which is that subdivision should be added to both objectives to recognise that inappropriate subdivision can also affect the productive capacity of rural land resource generally in objective two and productive capacity of highly productive land in objective three. Um, these resources should be protected from inappropriate subdivision, which is consistent with the outcome sought for the rural environment. Just add yeah. um, recommended amendments from the evidence um, um, are covered in Appendix Two, Appendix One, which is attached. Paper. Mr. Matthews supports the conclusion not to delete Objective Two, given that rural productive capacity is an identified strategic issue for the Wairapa. Matthews does not support the recommended amendment to Objective 2, but gives precedence to the protection of primary production characteristics and primary production capacity without the consideration um, of the need to provide for renewable generation in a rural environment. He states that the addition of a new rural uh, environment objective that explicitly recognises renewable generation in the rural environment is appropriate to retain the intent of Objective 2, while also recognising the renew renewable generation forms part of the character of the rural environment. Then Mr Ensor for Fulton Hogan considers objective two and three should clarify that highly productive land and productive capacity is protected from activities that have not been provided a pathway through the, the policy statement for highly productive land and therefore is inappropriate. Vincent for Potokotch New Zealand considers the recommended objectives to objective two in the 42 report could be better expressed for clarity. I consider the wording proposed by Ms Foster provides this clarity and this matters raised by Mr Matthews and Ms Stencil. And then Ms Foster and her evidence for Meridian Energy that a wording change to the recommended amendment to Objective 4 that accurately reflects Section 7C. So that changes from from amenity to amenity values, I agree with Ms Foster that the wording should be consistent with Section 7C and recommend the revision to, as shown in Appendix 1. 
The NSOR for Fulton Hogan expresses concern regarding the recommend, recommended amendment to Objective 4, adding reference to amenity values. This concern is based on a lack of understanding of what the rural amenity in the wire wrapper is, and that it requires consideration of land use activities incurring in the rural zone. I consider through the district plan review process and the proposed district plan process, including the statutory draft district plan process, that this understanding has been achieved. The general rural zone and rural lifestyle zone chapters set out these values and what are compatible and compatible activities and the objective and policy framework. And then Ms. Ross Rose, Rose, double check. Services, I think. Eastern Borough Services, New Zealand, uh, proposes amending wording for Objective 5. Recognise existing industry and infrastructure could be adversely affected by reverse sensitivity effects in addition to primary production activities. I remain of the view it's not appropriate to add reference to existing industry and infrastructure in Objective um, Rural Environment, Objective 5, as I consider the outcomes sought are already provided for in Objective Infrastructure 01 and the objectives in the zone chapters. Any reference to these other activities in the Rural Environment 05 objective would change the focus of this objective, which addresses the predominant conflict between rural lifestyle and primary production activity. Um, Ms Foster from Radiant Energy supports a new objective in the Rural Environment section of the Strategic Direction chapter, as she considers, as she considers there's a gap in recognising existing and potential future renewable energy generation activities in the rural, uh, general rural zone. Uh, Mr Matthews for Genesis Energy also supports a new objective in the rural environment section of the strategic direction chapter on renewable electricity generation, recognise the tr strategic importance of this matter in the rural environment. I acknowledge the contention of Ms Foster and Mr Matthews, however I do not consider there is a gap or a lack of recognition as the energy chapter applies district wide, i.e. to all zones. The same objective framework applies to all other district wide matters and activities such as infrastructure and hazardous facilities. And lastly, on rural environment, Ms. Levinson uh, considers two new objectives should be added to the rural environment section of the strategic uh, direction chapter to recognise the role and contribution of primary production activities, support, and similar activities to the wire I remain of the view that this recognition is already appropriately contained in the general uh, rural, rural zone chapter. Solna uh, considers various changes should be made to objective urban form and development um, 01 to give effect to and be more consistent with the national policy statement on urban development, the operative regional policy statement and proposed change one to the regional policy statement. Having considered the evidence of Solna on reflection, I agree that it is appropriate for the subjective to describe the urban form of the wire upper main towns um, as connected on the main transport routes. I also agree with Ms. Zona that the word larger could be confusing or potentially misinterpreted um, to, di to distinguish the five main towns from the small coastal elements. I recommend larger is replaced with main to describe the difference in nature and scale between the two types of urban areas in Wairapa's urban form. Ms. Zona considers it appropriate to add reference to supporting reductions in transport related greenhouse gas emissions to objective two due to the influence urban form has on these emissions. I agree with the sentiments expressed by Ms. Olna on the relationship between urban form and emissions, and on reflection, I consider it appropriate to add explicit reference to emissions in Objective 2 to reflect this relationship and that the outcomes sought from planned urban growth include a reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, amongst other matters. In Ms. Ensor for, or Mr. Ensor for Fulton Hogan is concerned that Objective 2 does not appropriately identify and avoid reverse sensitivity effects on quarrying activities, appropriately located urban growth. Recognise there is a potential conflict between urban growth and quarrying activities, uh, but I remain of the view that that, his conf that this conflict is appropriately managed within each zone um, and district-wide chapters for different types of land use activities, and it's not a strategic level issue in the wire Objective 4. Uh, Ms. Olna considers Objective 4 should be amended to reflect the benefits of efficiently using, upgrading and maintaining existing infrastructure. Again, I agree with the sentiments of Ms. Olna on this matter and consider the amended wording suggested better reflects the outcomes sought. And last matter for urban form development, 
Uh, Ms. Levinson considers Objective 6 would be amended for commercial activities located outside of town centres do not undermine the productive capacity of the requirement. I consider this additional wording undermines and reduces the effectiveness of this objective. As an urban environment objective, I consider it sole focus on uh, it should it should solely focus on urban environment matters, which in this case is the functioning and viability of the Warrapa town centres. I consider the matter raised by Ms. Levinson is appropriately addressed by provisions in the general rural zone. And last, the issue being infrastructure. Uh, Ms. Zolna for the Regional Council considers objective one is difficult to interpret as drafted. It incorporates three concepts. She considers alternative wording and structure would make the objective clearer. I do not consider this paragraph structure materially changes the usefulness or appropriateness of the objective. So I do not consider the alternative wording suggested by Ms. Zolna more appropriately achieves the purpose of RMA. In particular, I consider her point two relating to adverse effects does not align with the outcomes sought in section five of the RMA. I remain of the view in my assessment and recommendation of the full UTA report on objective one. And then Ms. Rosa for the look up. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, consider this objective one should include reference to broader types of infrastructure by adding reference to including additional infrastructure in this objective. The reason for this request is that waste management infrastructure can be subject to reverse sensitivity effects. I agree with Ms. Rosia that broader range of infrastructure recognised in the definition of additional infrastructure should also be included in objective one. Other types of infrastructure to the functioning of the districts and are potentially subject to reverse effects. I recommend Objective 1 be amended as shown in the pen. And lastly, Mr. Ensor considers Objective 1 should be amended to recognise the contribution of aggregate in supporting the provision of infrastructure. I consider the additional wording proposed by Mr. Ensor um, expands the objective beyond the strategic level. There are a range of factors that support the provision of infrastructure, such as available labour, materials, water supply, electricity. I do not consider highlighting one of these factors in the objective to be efficient or provide additional usefulness or relevance to the achieving the purpose of the RMA. Section 5, uh, that all the matters um, for doing the evidence that uh, consider a, a, a tension between submitters and officers in reviewing their submissions. Happy to take any questions on the introductory statement or the rule. For the Thank you, Mr. Wesley. Um, I'm, I'm going to kick off um, with one more. And then uh, really just to set the scene and provide some context. And then um, the panel will probably then drill down onto some of the um, seven topics, um, and particularly those. And continue. Um, um, paragraph six on your summary statement, and you've usually um, lifted the evidence that you've had regard to um, the legal submissions of East Lee and Greater Wellington. Yes, Thank you. It's the latter that I want to focus on on this initial contextual discussion. And I, I really want to, um, well, firstly, I'd like you to set the scene in terms of what your understanding or interpretation of the role of the strategic direction objectives are in terms of the wider plan. I thought that might be a question, so I made some notes <laughs> to, to cover that. So I assure you that this has not been rehearsed. <laughs> um, so, firstly, What's set out in the section 32 for the, the purpose of the strategic direction chapter and the matters card? Three matters listed. The first is directly responding to part two matters in, in the RMA. It's, uh, it's a principal importance in section six. So that's, that's the first, first consideration is. is, is what are, the, what are the key 
Section 6 matters of national importance that are relevant to the wire and then including them in the in the strategic. The second matter is responding to higher order planning documents. So that's the examples of the highly productive land and the urban development um, national policy statement. All foreseeable future issues in the wire which was informed. So other council planning processes, whether that's long term plan processes, um, where, the, where the community has been asked, what are the important issues for the wire wrapper? Um, so those three things combined were how, was what frames the strategic direction chapter. Um, and then the, the probably last point I'd add is that when you step back from the, the specific resource management issues, so for example, we, one of the most significant, if not the most significant issue for the plan review has been rural subdivision. So what, what when you step back um, from all of the individual chapters which deal with rural zone or an urban zone or biodiversity, step back and have a look broader, broader view, that's what the strategic um, direction chapter is doing. It's, it's looking across all the zones, looking across all the issues as to what are the, what are the common themes which apply to multiple. Um, and that's where I see them as not something that if it's covered specifically in the rural zone or specifically in the energy chapter or specifically in network utilities, that's where I see the need for those same matters in the strategic direction. They need to be that, that higher level. Thank you. What I what would have taken from that is that there's a statutory obligation um, underpinning the strategic direction chapter. Um, both in terms of part two and the higher order documents. But it's not simply a matter of um, mimicking. There's, there's an, an attempt to personalise it to the wire wrapper. Correct. In terms of the relationship of this chapter to other chapters, and particularly the objectives and policies in those chapters, there's been some discussion about whether there's a hierarchy or not. Um, this is that I've see from reading, reading material is that um, there is no hierarchy within the but um, objectives provide a sort of a a uh, how, would, how would describe it a sort of a helicopter or overriding um, direction that the other chapters the introductory paragraphs in the strategic direction chapter, I think, just confirm that's the role of the strategic direction objectives yes. in the chapter as a whole. And just to, to note the couple of examples that are mentioned in the introductory, it talks about they'll be relevant to um, future plan and development processes, so future plan changes. Yes. So you, Whatever the plan changes are, these will provide a, uh, that, that high level direction, those plan changes, whatever topic they relate to. And also, I'd say it'd be relevant to any significant resort implications for, for large scale proposals. The, the strategic direction chapter is likely to be relevant to, to those applications as well. What's the role, thank you for that. What's the role of the strategic direction objectives? In terms of the panel's consideration of objectives and policies that sit in underneath those in, in various chapters, do they have a do they have a role to play in terms of the panel's consideration of the appropriateness of provisions that sit in, in sort, of sub, sort of subsequent chapters? Yes, yes, um, and he is there to, is to make sure that there's no internal conflict between between a strategic direction objective and an objective in, a, in another chapter, whether it's his own chapter or a district wide one. Yes. So that would be the main one. See that um, not necessary if there are if there are adequate provisions in a in a subsequent chapter, there's no need to duplicate those objectives at a strategic level. Um, there will be some commonality of of um, 
I'll top it though, won't there? Correct. I mean, obviously, um, the RE objectives relating to rural production uh, some great relevance to the rural zone chapter Correct. and the rural lifestyle chapter, mm -hmm. presumably. And, and same with urban form and development, relevant to all our urban zone chapters. Residential and commercial. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Our strategic direction objectives, um, a statement of an outcome. Yes. Should they contain methods to achieve that outcome? Not, not in my view, no. That's that's, and in, in terms of the purpose of the strategic direction chapter, it is it is only does only contain objectives in it. Doesn't contain any any policies or or other methods on how those objectives will be achieved. But, in the other chapters. Yes. So would be fair. Would it be fair to categorise the strategic direction objectives as the what, and the subsequent objectives and policies, particularly the policies, as the how? Right. That was one of my points in my in my summary, responding to evidence from. Okay. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> Just bear with me a minute. I, I just really now want to focus on the teeth that the panel will face in terms of um, considering your reports and the reports of uh, submitters and the evidence of submitters. And I, I'm drawn to um, the Act in terms of Section 74 and Section 32 uh, in terms of the, uh, the direction that plans must give effect to or have regard to. Uh, certain documents, and also under Section 32, we must be satisfied that, um, particularly at the objective level, they are um, appropriate to get to those higher order documents. Um, and that's why I asked you whether you agreed the um, legal submission for um, Greater Wellington and Regional Council. <clears throat> so they've spent a, a lot of time discussing those two concepts. And particularly um, to the term give effect to and have regard to. And um, my reading of the legal submissions from the Greater Wellington um, Council are that in terms of give effect to, um, they are concerned that the proposed plan doesn't give complete effect to the MPS freshwater management. And doesn't have appropriate regard to both change, plan change number one to the regional policy statement. Um, I have some questions for the regional council. Um, for example, it's not clear to me whether the proposed plan gives effect to the operative RPS. Do you have a view on that? Uh, so in terms of giving effect to the national policy statement freshwater and the operative RPS, in my view, the proposed plan has has done that as notified, um, and that's particularly in the context of what's the role and jurisdiction of a district plan. Uh, my my reading of some of the evidence that I've noted in my introductory statement for regional council is it it goes beyond matters that are relevant to a district plan in terms of land use and subdivision. Um, the, the second matter regarding have regard to the proposed change to the regional policy statement. Um, reading the legal submissions from regional council, I think the how how it was summarised in terms of in the section 42 report, in terms of the consideration of that plan change, um, I think it could have been better expressed in, in hindsight uh, in terms and what to clarify what I'm meaning there is that the proposed plan is notified had had regard to that Proposed plan change to the RPS because it was prepared after the yes. after the plan change, the regional policy statement plan change was was notified as well. So a timing issue there. Um, and so there's nothing in terms of the policy regional policy statement plan change process. Mm -hmm. It's still going through the hearings and still waiting a decision on that. So there's no there's nothing. It hasn't progressed in the plan change process where there's any new. We haven't progressed to the decisions on on submission stage, so it hasn't changed from when the proposed plan was notified. Yes. So I think, yeah, in reflection, that could be better expressed in the report. Um, okay. 
I want to come back to those two issues, um, giving effect to a, a national policy statement. And um, if I can uh, use the MPS FM as the example, um, the regional council have been critical that that on and for two to three reasons, um, including that. Um, that there's a uh, functionality and responsibility um, difference between regional councils in terms of section 30 and district councils in terms of 31 in terms of giving effect to the MPS. And that um, the, the flavor that's come through in some of the reports from the, the offices is that really this is a regional council jurisdiction. Um, the regional council dispute that and um, draw the panel's attention to 3.5 or the MPS, which requires um, district councils to include objectives, policies, and methods in the proposed plan to promote effects and avoid remedy effects um, in the freshwater um, space. And they believe that, uh, that the proposed plan doesn't achieve that. Uh, what's your response to that? Uh, Similar to what I said earlier, that the proposed plan does, in my view, does do that for matters within the jurisdiction of a district plan. So land use and subdivision matters. And um, in terms of before you for the strategic direction chapter, um, it can take you to the natural environment section of, of that chapter. Um, and so objective two refers to the Warapa Moana. Yep. So it's, uh, the objective is the Māori of Warapa Moana is protected and restored. And then objective five <clears throat> management, and with the recommended amendment, it's, it would read freshwater, land, water bodies, ecosystems, and receiving environments are managed using an integrated approach in, collabor in collaboration with Tangata Whenua, the community, and other government agencies. So just highlighting, highlighting those two examples, in my view, that they're just two examples of how the plan recognises and gives effect to that integrated approach of the, of the freshwater policy statement. Okay. Now this all, um, I think um, Ms Robertson um, covers this matter also in relation to the request from the Regional Council to have a Three Waters chapter. Um, I think she's listed uh, in a forensic way those those provisions that the proposed plan contain in relation to fresh water and stormwater. I must do it. away, we'll cover that. I must do it. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Okay, moving to the, the test of um, have regard to, which is a test for any proposed plan, in this case, the proposed um, plan change number one to the RPS fits into that category. The legal submissions from the regional council say that officers have been too dismissive in um, looking at the relevance of, of the RPS, that it's um, what, whilst it's in it, they say that um, it's been dismissed on the basis that it's very early in the stage. Um, that it represents a policy shift, um, what's called a paradigm shift, um, and um, that it's subject to considerable public interest and the provisions could change. That they seem to be the three reasons that um, officers have consistently uh, identified as um, in terms of having regard to. Um, the, the legal submissions from the Regional Council say, be that as it may, um, that's not a reason to just summarily, summarily dismiss the RPS but the proposed plan change to one, and that um, there needs to be a genuine attempt. I think that's the wording um, to have a, to try and incorporate those provisions. Um, what's your response to that? Yeah. But, um, that's, as I said earlier, I think in, in hindsight, that could have been also better expressed in the 42A report, and that's because of the timing of when the regional policy statement plan change was notified and the proposed district plan being prepared with regard to that statement uh, with that plan change that the notified provisions already have have had have had regard to the, the regional policy statement plan change and because the regional policy statement plan change hasn't progressed to the next stage of the, of its process so no decisions on submissions there's um, there's nothing nothing new or different um, that officers can have regard to, and and that that's that's different from when the plan was notified. Okay. So this, your view, there's nothing new in the 
in the provisions at this stage. At this stage. That the plan would have had regard to. Good. And and having read some of the material that was presented to the hearings on on the RPS plan change, there's been significant changes as peers recommended through that process. Okay. Uh, at this point, it, to me, it's not appropriate to, to consider recommendations only. It's waiting for decisions on those on the submission stage, and and at that point, to consider the consider them. Have regard to and actually give effect at that stage. That's beyond appeal. Yes. What's your understanding, Mr. Westney, of when decisions might be due? Uh, shortly. Shortly. But, but that's, that's the latest. <laughs> and what shortly means, whether that's next week or <laughs> months away. I hope they can see Ms. Sol can elaborate on what shortly means. So, so I'll just take there that maybe later in this these hearings proceedings, yeah. um, I'd anticipate the decisions would be released sometime during these proceedings. Yes. So there may need to be um, consideration of those decisions on yes. the you're hearing today. And I want to come back to that just very briefly. And I'm, I'm nearly there, Adel. Um, nearly there. Um, there's, there's the directive to give effect to an operative RPS. There's a direction to have regard to proposed RPS. You've already acknowledged that there's quite a policy shift the operative RPS and what plan change one's proposing. Um, are those two tests compatible? Are they mutually exclusive? Um, have you given any thought to to that? To me, they, they are compatible, uh, but it depends on the nature of that, that policy shift. Um, if, if it's fundamentally, if there's a fundamental change in policy yes. from um, I'm trying to think of an example to give you um, yeah, where where it's, you know, let's say the operative RPS was going this direction to achieve whatever it is, and the plan change was going this direction to, uh, or, or the or the outcome was going to, you know, you're going that way to, and the operative and going that way, and the proposed plan change, then yes, there's a, that, is a, that would be a conflict, and you'd have to reconcile which one do you do you give greater weight to um, at this point, and that's, that's in part why it, um, and in my assessment, recommending give, giving less weight to the plan change um, because it was has been contested through the submission process until these decisions on those on those matters. Um, I'd be saying give less weight, and you have to in terms of those two tests, you have to give effect to. So you have to act on the operative um, regional policy statement, and and that's why the, the test of have regard to um, is you have to consider it, but not necessarily act on it, which is my understanding of what the Regional Council's legal submissions are also saying. Yes, the first imperative is a mandatory one, have effect to. The second one, um, have regard to, involves some degree of way. Of, okay. A final question, and you'll be glad to hear, is um, given that the decisions on the post RPS, plan change one, are going to come out before the panel issues its recommendations and decisions. Um, What's the best way of to trying to integrate that into reporting um, over the various hearing streams? Have you given any thought to that? I think it comes down to timing as to when yes when those decisions come out, and the more well, the later the later those decisions come out, the more potentially problematic it would be. Yes, um, if, if they come out within the next month. Then be this hearing and potentially hearing two. That, that and and it'll be particularly this. Those are the topics covered in this hearing would be more relevant for the ones for hearing two. I'd suggest that um, uh, a, a direction from the panel for submitters and officers to reconsider the, the, the points in contention in light of in light of those decisions. Yes. And potentially pick that up at the wrap up hearing at the end of the process because there may be other consequential issues that come up. Certainly, and that's that was my next question. Would it would it be appropriate to revisit that at the what's colloquial called a wrap up hearing, but sometimes it's also called an integration hearing? Would that be which could be in in May next year? At that stage, the um, 
plan change number one to the RPS were moved along another step. We're going to have a decision switch, but we'll also know what appeals are being lodged, which will also have a, a bearing on weight too. But there could be some provisions that are not subject to appeal that would then have legal weight. Okay. Or more mm -hmm. would have could, could also be deemed to be operative. That'd be treated as an effect. Yes. If the timing isn't kind to the process, um, is there a, a possibly a revisiting some matters where there is a an ill fit between the RPS, which then has to be given effect to, um, and the district plan by way of, say, a variation or a plan change? Potentially. I think it would depend on the, the nature and the magnitude of the of the change changes, and this is all uh, unknown at this point, based on whatever the decisions on the regional policy statement are. Right. Well, these are, I spent a little bit of time, thank you for your answers, I spent a little bit of time on this because they are an entree to the sort of questions that the panel will have for the regional council. Um, but that also, I, I wanted to share with um, those that are present and those that will ultimately be listening on time that this is something that the panel is taking very seriously in terms of its responsibilities of giving effect to either the higher order documents and having regard to those that are still going through the process. Not an easy task. So, um, on that basis, I think the, we'd like to then move to each of the strategic directions um, and uh, to see what questions there are. I, I've got some, but I've dominated the questions at this stage. Should we, should we go to the climate change and resilience objective? This is one in your way of thought, and that you've covered it off also in your, in your uh, summary. Um, Anyone have any questions in relation to the uh, CCR of objectives? Hand up if you do. I would just like to ask for a clarification. Yes. So, in your report, we have Appendix 1 recommended amendments to strategic direction objectives. Is the handout where you have revised recommended changes, is that an addition to these or is that? Yeah. Uh, the, what, what I've handed out today so, uh, supersedes what's in the 42A, what, what was attached yeah. to the report. Supersedes or is? Supersedes. supersedes. Of course, we don't have a coloured copy. Yeah, I just put that. I'm so your original recommended amendments, they are now not relevant? Uh, no, so they're still relevant. Okay, that's not just the clarification. Yeah, on. so still still relevant, but I've, I've recommended further changes or slightly yeah. different yeah. changes. Based on the evidence that's since that report came in. Thank you. Yeah, slightly up. Apologies. The, the, the appendix one that would have been attached, you would have seen the blue with the additional recommendations. Thank you. Easy to figure out from the world. I'll just see, does that answer your question? Yes. It's all about a confusion going on. Yeah. Commissioner Plummer has a question. Yeah, my, my question is not specific to any one objective, but it sort of covers the whole one, and it's in regard to uh, Mr Ensel's evidence with Quarry. A lot of his evidence is about the reverse sensitivities. Um, and um, I suppose that, paraphrasing a little bit, they're asking for a little bit of strategic protection, I suppose, for the activity of quarrying and how it affects uh, every part of what we do in our district. Um, and we talked a lot uh, with workshops about reverse sensitivities um, and the issue of quarrying. But as we become restricted more and more on what we can do in our rivers, where we got where we get a lot of our quarrying, obviously we're going to be going to land-based aggregate because everything we do, no matter how we develop, needs aggregate. Is that something that perhaps does need to be in our um, policy statement and, and right at the start to say this is actually a special industry or, or something that potentially needs a bit more protection? Because certainly... Certainly, the evidence from or the the submission from Stenson talks about that is not uh, it's not quite protected enough for, from their perspective. Yep. No, so, um, so just in response, except, except the um, context you've summarised in terms of the nature of quarrying activities and the demand for aggregate in the Wairapa, and that you're likely to see more on land. 
quarries rather than extracting aggregate from, from the rivers for, um, for reasons you've indicated. Um, in terms of the evidence of Mr. It's, I agree it's an issue in the Wairapa, but is it a strategic strategic issue in, in terms of the, um, thinking about the district, the, the issues facing facing the Wairapa as a whole? Um, and in my view, it's not it's not a strategic, if I think of all the different issues facing the Wairapa, a specific issue acquiring isn't isn't one. Um, but I'm not saying it's not an issue in its in its own right. And just looking at the rural zone chapter, which um, where predominantly the quarrying activities is undertaken, um, it talks about reverse sensitivity. That says um, the specific objective about reverse sensitivity in the rural zone, which is sensitive activities are designed and located to avoid or mitigate reverse sensitivity effects incompatibility with um, the primary production activities, so farming, other land use activities, transport corridors. So in that wording, other land use activities, that's where I'd put quarry. That's one of the perspectives. And then there's specific policy recognition later on that quarries can have that reverse sensitivity issue. Well, I suppose if I, if I drive down the central corridor in the Wairapa, you've got quarrying just on the other side of Wainawa, then we've got quarrying just outside Greytown, um, between Greytown and Carterton, then you've got quarrying now in Featherston, um, all within um, when we look at our projected growth areas, all literally right on the boundaries. Um, and that's, I think that that seems to be part of the concern that is, is raised in um, Stencil's thing is what happens when the town expands to where those quarries are. Mm. Um, how, do, how do we, how do we manage that with it? Because they are, logically, they are some of our strategic assets here in the Wairapa because of um, required for any growth, whether it be well, whatever you think of, we require aggregate. So how do we, uh, you know, you can, we we can't sort of say, oh, we'll, we'll substitute that for something else. Um, whereas most of the other things we do, you can substitute, but this one you can't. Certainly not the technology we have to this day. So that's the I think if I'm if I'm reading right what their submission is, that's where their concern is about how do we protect that and how do we show that that is a strategic asset that we need to actually, um, so that they don't get sort of forced out um, by a bit of So I accept your point and, and my view is that, that that issue's effectively dealt with in the other chapters. It's dealt with in the rural zone and when you look at the um, future urban zone that that deals with what's appropriate for for um, managing that potential conflict between those activities, um, and so I think where I where I see it, I don't see that as a strategic issue for the wipe as a whole. Similar my similar view on renewable energy at this point, I think it's adequate, adequately covered by the energy chapter, and it's not needed as a specific as objective in the strategic direction chapter. But that's your this is this is your role as the panel to. You know, if you've heard my view, you'll hear Ms. Densor's view further and Ms. Ms. Foster and the Matthews probably on Thursday yep. around this. So, yeah. Okay. Just, just cool. further to that, Mr. Worthy, is there any national guidance <clears throat> in relation to the quarrying issue that might lend its support to um, provisions at the strategic level? I think it comes nothing, not, not in terms of a national policy statement. Um, <laughs> an RMA statutory document comes to mind. Um, there's this general, I call it industry, industry guidance from the Quarry and Aggregate Association, and general guidance on the Ministry for Environment Quality Planning website around managing issues for the quarry um, and aggregate industry. But no, nothing specific. So your 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 view is that the strategic directions that are in the RE chapter, and perhaps uh, in the infrastructure and urban development factors collectively provide some direction, but that's then picked up by the individual chapters in the plan, such as the rural chapter, Correct. in relation to um, the importance of quarrying to infrastructure and, and urban development. Correct. That's, that's, my, that's my view. I just, I'm, I was going to move on to the uh, renewable energy issue, but if anyone else had any questions before that, um, this is the rule. The, the REG issue is one that's been contested already as a genesis. Um, 
they uh, you you have um, you have said that uh, don't support a new strategic objective in relation to renewable energy, paragraph ninety one of your forty two A. We acknowledge that renewable energy is important in the transition to a low carbon future, but that a standalone objective is not is not considered to be more effective or efficient to achieve the purpose. Um, that objective CR01 already effectively encompasses the development of renewable energy and is further supported by the objectives in the energy sector. Um, Ms. Foster take an issue with that and um, her evidence at page six. She said uh, she doesn't agree with Mr. Wesney uh, um, that the objective 01 does the does the work um, and recognising the role that renewable energy generation plays in shifting um, the local Warrapa economies from a reliance on non renewable to renewable. Um, he talks about the importance of the NPS and that her view is that. Um, the level of strategic, given the level of strategic issues, they warrant a response at the strategic level, and that the energy chapter isn't sufficient. Um, and I just want to contrast the difference between your answer to um, Councillor Plummer on the on the quarrying issue, which doesn't have any national direction, and the renewable energy um, one, which has. National direction in the form of the NPS on renewable energy 2011 2012. And I think it's going through a review at the moment. Also, um, given that we're required to give effect in the plan to national policy statements, um, there might be an expectation that we might see a strategic objective relating to renewable energy that's specific to that rather than implicit in terms of what's your response to that? This this is one that I've been back and forth in my mind on because yeah I can see both both for the reasons you've you've summarised in the in the evidence as well and it's not clear cut and I, I, to me the, the the national policy giving effect to the national policy statement for um, renewable energy yes. to, to me the proposed plan is notified um, does do that principally through the. A specific chapter on energy, yes. which which um, recognises the, the various nature and scale of renewable electricity generation. Um, that you'll have your domestic, residential, um, and other other small scale renewable electricity generation through to through to large scale ones. So, from from my perspective, I, I think the energy chapter at, at, a, at a whole. Does give effect to the national policy statement, but then it, it, it's then stepping back and looking at the wire wrapper in terms of those. Like what are the overall strategic issues for the wire wrapper, and where does renewable electricity sit in there? And while it's come up um, as part of the review from the likes of the um, energy uh, electricity generators, and also some community members have expressed concern about it. Uh, it, it didn't to me come through strongly as this is something that's going to be significant in, in the wire wrappers um, future. Let's not say that's not going to be a feature of it. It's at, at a strategic level. I just didn't see it as being as being um, significant. But it's a, it is a very much line call from my perspective. It's it's yeah. What 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 um, I and the panel don't have the benefit of at the moment is a, a, an understanding of the. Um, of the energy chapter provisions mm -hmm. and um, how they might land, and that's for that's for a subsequent hearing. Um, what I'd invite you to do in your right of reply is to draw our attention to what those provisions are as notified in the energy chapter, and how you believe that they give effect to the NPS in a more appropriate manner than having a strategic projection that once objective that might sit above those to provide some guidance on how they are interpreted. Because I think what um, is too Alan, what Ms. Foster is saying is that it's not just a matter of recognising the benefits of REG, but recognising those benefits in terms of climate issues. And 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 you know given that, that um, CCR is about climate resilience. Um, 
on the face of it, it seems that there might be a role for some recognition of that and that objective uh, over and above what might be contained in the energy chapter. But I'm saying that in a blind sense because I still don't, un don't understand at this point what those provisions are and how they've been challenged. So could I leave that with you and, and your right of reply? I will break at 10.30. Are there any other questions from the panel on the um, climate change, climate risk change and resilience objectives? Yeah. Okay. Let's take us to the rule and rule. Of rule. Are we, are we objectives? Or natural. Oh, sorry, natural. You too, sorry. Question from the panel for Mr. Wesley on on the environment objectives. No. <laughs> Um, sorry. Well, I've got one question. Um, sorry, no. Just double check that. Yeah. I get my question is about the new objective that's being requested um, from Greater Wellington in relation to Mana OKY. Um, and uh, this is uh, this relief has been, uh, I think, opposed by Meridian and Genesis also. Um, you've uh, recommended against a new objective. Um, some of the reasons were canvassed earlier in relation to giving effect to the MPSPM. Um, is there anything further in response to the, the wording of that objective that you'd like to draw the panel's attention to? Uh, only, only what I covered in my introductory statement, the uh, paragraph 17. Yes. Yeah. There was a point made by Ms. Foster and if you glance for Meridian in response to the Regional Council's submission, I, um, consider that the wording goes beyond what's what's relevant for subdivision and land use developments in terms of in the context of <coughs> the purpose of the act. Yes. Okay. Well we're going to hear from um Stolner on this on Thursday. Mm -hmm. Um and you'll have an opportunity to respond again um in light of any questions that we have to mm -hmm. her. So we can park that for the moment. All right. And that takes us now to uh the issue three rule of environment objectives. You've covered it, paragraphs 19 through to 23 in your summary. Any questions from the panel in relation to those um, rural environment objectives? RE01 RE through to RE05, I believe. Already covered the um, renewable energy. Ms. Foster's raised. And uh, I think getting away quite easy. I'm sure. I take this to issue four, which is urban form and development. Um, these are uh, strategic uh, direction of that give a tip. Presumably to uh, the MPSUD. And I just hear yeah, that that's really only applicable to Marston being the tier three council, uh, but it's still relevant relevant to the districts as a whole. Yes. This is a um this is another example of the regional council's concern about plan post plan giving effect to a national policy statement. Um, um I think Ms. Solomon takes issue with um the applicability of the um, MPSUD to different and believes that um, 
that this that the spirit I'm paraphrasing here that the spirit of the MPSUD is that um, the objectives policy should be given effect to district wide. Um, do you have any comment on that particular matter? Uh, yes, in terms of the, the it's a relevant national policy statement, but uh, it's, it's relevant in how it's applied to the local context. I think that's the that's the key that some of the policies and clauses in that national policy statement uh, apply to apply to metropolitan areas, not a hot sale to the Wairapa wide. Yes, mm -hmm. applied to the co local context. You have in any event uh, recommends some changes to 01, 02, and 04, um, missions from Greater Wellington, um, some nuancing of those objectives. Well, well, any of those changes, particularly the change to REO, uh, sorry, UFD 01, do we have any? Um, uh, down the stream effects on the policies and objectives in the residential and commercial zones? No, from not, not from my perspective. As I said in my, my opening summary, that most of the recommended changes are for clarity, um, clarification purposes. I um, haven't recommended any consequential amendments and do not see any any yeah, consequential amendments at this stage to um, so that if you like the flow diagram between the strategic objectives and those objectives and policies and the residential urban zones are still intact. Hey, we're making good progress. Um, that takes us on to key issue five, which is the infrastructure objectives um, and the issues here from Greater Wellington and Priory Services. Um, and I don't think you have recommended any changes here. It added in response to the evidence. Um, Rosa, Rosia, mm -hmm. added, added reference to additional infrastructure to capture the yes. range of interest to, to them. Yeah, that's an O one, isn't it? Yes. Mm -hmm. that, that's that, that's mm -hmm. remind me of picking up here. Um, is the where where does the term additional infrastructure derive from, and is it, and is it defined? That comes from the national policy statement for urban development, ah. and it's defined defined in that document. And but it's different to infrastructure. Correct. It's it's as it's the wording that implies it, it's additional it includes additional infrastructure, which is not covered by the Resource Management Act definition of infrastructure. So is there a hierarchy of infrastructure in, in the RMA sense? I'm familiar with the term. Briefly, significant infrastructure, which is sort into RSI. Mm -hmm. um, does that imply that there's, or well, and that there's nationally significant infrastructure? Is not in the proposed plan as as no as, as notified. It just refers to just keeps it simple, and relies on the term infrastructure, and its RMA definition, which includes all your common types: electricity, telecommunications, yeah. ports, and the like. What, what additional infrastructure is the definition of that includes includes more of your community and social infrastructure okay. so schools education facilities health which are not covered by the definition and um, of infrastructure itself in the RMA yes is is the term infrastructure defined in the plan yes which is but it it, it repeats the RMA definition yes how does that appear or contrast with the definition of regionally significant infrastructure and the operative regional policy statement and in the proposed plan change one. I need to come back to you on that one. Could you? <laughs> yes. David, just on that class, I, yes. I understood that to mean any infrastructure that hadn't been developed yet. No. Yeah, I can see. I mean, you can't specify stuff that's still out there being developed. Yes, that, that's my uh, understanding of it when I read it. Yeah, it's is that am I up the wrong tree on that? Yes and no. It's that uh, it's to me it's unfortunate in the context how you've used additional, which is future. Um, to me that that's uh, that's um, how it could be interpreted. 
but the, the definition in the national policy statement for what additional infrastructure means, it's, it's additional types of infrastructure, not, on. not future, yeah. future built. No. So it's a, so the, the way that that would be clarified in the district plan, the proposed district plan, is we show, um, well, the plan shows all of the defined terms in italics. So someone would see, um, I don't think it's shown there, um, they'll see the, the two words additional infrastructure shown in italics. So that would then be the, the trigger to go, we need to, I need to go look at the definition in the plan to understand what additional infrastructure means. So that will clarify it's not future infrastructure, it's it's the schools, health and those, those other types of infrastructure. Does that, does that cover us then if the RMA rewrite comes in and they define infrastructure in a slightly different way than we're covered by that? Um, no, and Ms Robertson will cover this in her um, topic this up um, later on in terms of yeah. member who, but someone, someone easily in their legal submissions highlights that because the definitions in the proposed plan rely on definitions in legislation or you know, policy statements, that scenario you've just highlighted, what happens when they change? Does that change the definition of the district plan or not? I'll leave, leave Solitaire to yeah, run that one through, through you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Joe. Social. Um, the, we see that it includes things like schools, but it also includes um, places like the line. I am the definition. If you've got the section 42A report handy on strategic direction, yeah. that starts paragraph, paragraph 329. It's the definition of additional infrastructure. Wow. And is that on definitions, do you say? Uh, no, it's strategic direction. Okay. Oh. The report. Public open space, community infrastructure. Top of page 46. Page 46, yes. Um, so it refers to the potential, it refers to social infrastructure, such as schools and health facilities. So it depends whether you would include Marae as social infrastructure. Okay. Mm. Three. When you say two. I determine yes. um, whoever's interpreting the plan would 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 have to decide is that so I'd ultimately sit with council to decide whether Marai were included in that term social infrastructure. It's not not explicitly referenced. Being, Could it be? Uh, some not in the approach we've taken to adopting terms defined in other in other documents. So because this is defined in the national policy statement, it, we, we in uh, no changes to that definition because the potential conflict or, or difference in what's what included or not included in that in that definition. Think of that. I'll, I'll come back to you on on that. Yeah. Yeah. That's <laughs> Wesley Quid D is not uh, exclusive, is it? Sure, yes. it? It talks about it just gives examples such as schools. Okay. Yeah. And, and presumably that would include Kura. Yeah. Kura yeah, sure. And um healthcare facilities, but anything else that the social infrastructure. Yes, but it will come down to interpretation, won't it? So I'm just thinking it's just up to the, the implementation guidance for the policy statement on development with it. If, guidance might have made a reference to a range of activities. Yes. Any final wrap up questions to Mr. Wesney before we, we break? Uh, Mr. Wesney, is there any clarification that you need from us? So I've made some notes on some homework for you in terms of your um, right of reply. Um, your paragraph 42, which is your last paragraph of your summary, provides a very useful indication of the matter that is still outstanding. Mm -hmm. That will be useful um, 
and on testing evidence and the next deliberation. Um, quickly, well, I, I particularly would like you to respond to item C, which is the uh, renewable energy issue, um, and also um, what's referred on the evidence of um, on it on Thursday, item D. I simply take the point that there are provisions, there are objectives, policies, and rules in the proposed plan um, that give effect to 3.54 of the MPS. Question that I've got is: Would they be? Would it be appropriate to have something that sits above those um, to give effect to the MPS? And in the same way, which is basically the same question I've put you in terms of. REG, um, would 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 both of those uh, chapters benefit from having some strategic overview um, in the in, um, in the strategic direction chapter? Okay, let's. The uh, only other question, sorry, the only question I had: Will we get a soft copy of your summary statement? Yes. Yep, great. Yeah, you'll upload it to the website today. Good. Thank you. For changes. Yeah. Yes. Yep. You'll be able to see the red and <coughs> red and the blue <coughs> on that. On that. Thank you. And I think that will that go under the um, officer summary statement? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> well, we'll take the morning tea adjournment. Thank you, Mr. Wesley. And we'll come back um, in fifteen minutes, and we'll hear from the last one. I'll take you. Who's next up? I'm going to get to bed. Yes. <coughs> Oh.